From the John R. Tata Auditorium at Lemonster City Hall, this is the only debate between the candidates for State Senate for the Worcester Middlesex District. The candidates are incumbent Democrat John Cronin and Republican challenger Nick Pirro. We only have one hour and a lot to get to, so we're gonna get right to work. Question one, Governor Maura Healey declared a state of emergency as a historic influx of migrants sought help from the Commonwealth's strained shelter system. Massachusetts is the only state in the country with a right to shelter law, which guarantees homeless families access to emergency shelter. Would you reconsider this law? And what kinds of policies and procedures would you support going forward to deal with the ongoing migrant crisis? Senator Cronin. So first, thank you, Kevin. It's an honor to be here with you, and I want to thank my opponent, Mr. Pirro, for joining us here tonight uh, in this forum. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult issue. Uh, we have a shelter system that is broken, that is not working, and that is unsustainable. And our job in state government is to make really difficult choices. Uh, we have a $56 billion state budget that we did in the last fiscal year. Every dollar that we appropriate to education is a dollar that doesn't get appropriated to transportation. Every dollar that we appropriate to our EA and shelter system is a dollar that doesn't get appropriated to save Neshoba Valley Medical Center. It doesn't get appropriated to increase local aid to communities. It doesn't get appropriated to send more money to uh, fix our roads. Um, and so that's why I am one of five Democrats who broke with my party in the Senate and broke with the governor, and I voted uh, across the aisle with the Republicans to reform this system and against an, an expansion of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to expand again a program that is not working, that we know is broken. Uh, we need uh, bipartisanship on this issue. Uh, and I'm very critical of our two U.S. Senators. Our two U.S. Senators are both Democrats. They voted against a bipartisan compromise that would have secured our border and sent resources to do that. They voted against a compromise that would have sent money to our states and tightened our asylum. That's something I would have voted for and supported. But let's remember the real reason that we can't get comprehensive federal immigration reform. It's because Donald Trump did uh, really the most shameless thing that you can do in politics. He told every Republican in Congress, no deal. I don't want a law. I don't want a fix. I want the issue. Not because it's good for my country, not because it's going to help people, not because it's going to help states, because it's good for me and it's going to help me win the election. So uh, we need bipartisanship, compromise, uh, pragmatism. That's what I brought to this issue as a senator, and I'll continue to do. Mr. Pirro. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Mr. Cronin, for being here tonight. Um, the migrant crisis right now is costing us over $1 billion annually. Um, right now, the policies allow for immediate access to emergency housing for migrants, uh, basically incentivizing arrivals. Um, there's also a large lack of transparency with over 600 emergency incidents with no reported housing facilities and no public disclosures of details. Um, the right to shelter law needs to be changed. We need to implement a residency requirement and enforce a six-month residency requirement before allowing qualifying uh, new rivals for housing. Um, we need to honor the federal immigration laws and ensure cooperation with federal authorities, including ICE detainees uh, for migrants accused of serious crimes. Um, and we need full disclosure of incident details and contracts with the vendors managing the migrant crisis with regular reporting on the expenditures. Um, and then we need to prioritize funds for the long-term residents of Massachusetts first, uh, and then with whatever else we have to help others. Okay, as we will with every round, we're gonna open it up after each candidate has uh, the opportunity to answer the question with a five minute open discussion where the candidates can directly interact with each other. They can question each other, rebut, clarify, add anything new. Either candidate want to uh, talk about more about this issue. Uh, Senator Cronin, do you have a suggestion of how many people that we should be letting into the state yeah, right sure. now? Yeah, so, sure. So I do. So that's why I voted with uh, the Republican minority leader in the Senate to prioritize veterans, to prioritize people who have a residency, uh, who have been here in Massachusetts. Um, but, but again, we need to get back to the core of why this problem 
uh, that we're facing is here. And it's because of the failure of federal comprehensive immigration reform. So we need the feds to step up. We need Republicans and Democrats to come together to secure our border, uh, to tighten our asylum process, and to send money to states to help us mitigate this mess. Uh, and you know we can debate the, the shelter law until the, the cow goes over the moon. We don't really have a right to shelter here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have a shelter system that is subject to appropriation. There's no such thing as a a right that is subject to appropriation. So I voted against expansion of the program. I voted against hundreds of millions of dollars to, again, something that is unsustainable and something that will make the problem worse. And I think, to be frank and to be blunt, there's a lot of agreement between me and my opponent here on this issue. Well, I would disagree that we've got some, but I think we've got some differences there. So you're saying that you don't think that we have a right to shelter here in Massachusetts. Then all the people that are coming here and end up sleeping at the airport and than people sleeping on the streets. This is, why are they coming here if we don't have, if they're not being incentivized to come here? They are incentivized to come here, and that's why I voted with the Republicans to reform the system. Okay. Anything else from either of you on this issue? No. Moving on, question two. A poll in June conducted by WCVB-TV in Boston and UMass Amherst showed that housing affordability and the ongoing shortage of housing remains the number one concern of Massachusetts voters. What are your ideas to tackle this issue? Mr. Piero, two minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, the issue that I see the most with the housing is the unfunded mandates that are coming from Boston and putting the financial strain on the local towns forcing them to increase taxes or reduce services, um, as well as zoning laws uh, that create regulatory policies to limit housing and development, which increases costs. Uh, we need to end unfunded, man unfunded mandates, push for legislation that ensures that the state covers the cost of any mandates they impose on local governments uh, to avoid budget strain. We need to uh, promote local control over zoning. Um, we should not be forced with things like the MBTA Communities Act to require zoning overlay districts, we should be able to determine that with the home rule. Um, we need to incentivize affordable housing development and provide some tax incentives or grants to developers who commit to building affordable housing uh, in the areas that need it. Um, and then we also need to do something to cap the property tax, um, to uh, advocate for measures to limit property tax growth, ensuring the ending the financial burden on homeowners and renters. Thank you. Senator Cronin. I'm really proud of the, the work and the progress that we've made in my two terms and four years in the Massachusetts Senate on housing. Uh, this summer I voted for and uh, with my, uh, my colleague, Representative Higgins, we passed the most historic investment uh, that is gonna spur housing production in Massachusetts history, more than $5 billion. And the, at the heart of this issue is supply. We need to build more housing and we need to be talking about supply side solutions. So we have uh, authorized a bond bill of $5 billion that is gonna create thousands of new units across the, the Commonwealth in every type of housing, from d deeply affordable to market rate. One of the uh, jobs that I am most proud of that I have in the Massachusetts Senate is I chair the, the Gateway Cities Caucus, and it is a coalition of senators and representatives from 26 of the most economically depressed corners of the state. Fitchburg, Lemonster, Worcester, Holyoaks, basically all the mill towns that have been less, left behind over the, 50, or the last 50 years. Uh, and I am really proud that as part of uh, tax reform package that we passed last year, we included a uh, tax incentive that's going to spur private investment in gateway cities and result in thousands of new units. It's called the Housing Development Incentive Program. It was our number one priority for the Gateway Cities Caucus, uh, and we got it done. So we expanded a tax credit that had existed since the Patrick administration, and we tripled the size of it. Not only did we do that, uh, triple the size from 10 million per year to 30 million, but we cleared a backlog of 56 million dollars in projects that were shovel ready uh, and ready to be built in gateway cities. So that's how we build our middle class in Fitchburg and Lemonster. We incent private investment. We work with the business community, and that's going to help us build our middle class and make sure that we are a place where young families are coming to start and raise their families. Thank you. Up to five minutes for open discussion on the issue. Uh, with the MBTA Communities Act and the forced mandates from the state level, how does that benefit the local level and with people knowing 
from each individual city and town what they need. I could not disagree stronger with my opponent on this issue. So the MBTA Communities uh, Act asks municipalities, cities and towns across the Commonwealth to zone where around public transportation. And we need to do that if we're gonna build more housing. We need to build 200,000 more units of housing here in the state if we're just gonna catch up to the demand today. So, you know, I am really confused by my opponent uh, putting forward and promoting ideas that are anti-business, anti-growth, anti-workforce. Uh, we have a problem of a thousand uh, young people um, every week who are leaving the state because they can't afford housing. And my opponent wants to um, kowtow to towns who don't want any new development. Here in our gateway cities, uh, we have a, a different challenge. We have a challenge financing uh, new construction and getting private dollars invested here. That's why I promoted the Housing Development Incentive Program, and we've done a number of other things. Devons, 1993, there was a housing cap set, and it has been there, and they've been at that cap for almost 10 years. We raised that cap in the Economic Development Bill, and that's going to allow the production of hundreds of more units. So economic development, at the heart of economic development, at the heart of being pro-business, at the heart of being pro-growth, at the heart of building building a middle class here in north central Massachusetts is building more housing. My opponent wants to kowtow to nimbyism. I don't. I want families to stay here, to build their families here, and I want their kids to be able to stay and afford to live here in north central Massachusetts. Senator Cronin. We're going to fail at that if, if we uh, adopt the, the policies of my opponent. Supply side, build, build, build. Okay. Where do you plan on these people getting health care or education if you're putting the cart before the horse here? No, I'm not. Yes. Absolutely not. Housing is at the core of economic development, right? If you go to Devons, and Devons is here in my district, there are nearly 900 engineers that show up to Commonwealth Fusion, right? 900 engineers who make over $100,000 a year. I want those people with PhDs and master's degrees to raise their family in places like Fitchburg and Lemonster. I don't want them doing a reverse commute to Lexington. So we have a competitive advantage. Why, if we can why would they come here without here. a good school? system or an overrun school system with you and having hospitals close under your watch. That's irresponsible okay, on your behalf. Economic development is the way we stabilize our health care system. The maternal health unit in Neshoba Valley Medical Center closed for one reason. It's because we have uh, a lot of poor people that live here in north central Massachusetts who rely on Medicaid, who rely on mass health. What do you want to stop giving them health care? So we stabilize our health care system by getting young professionals with great jobs jobs, who have commercial insurance, who are going to improve our payer mix. That's how we keep essential services here. That's how we keep our hospitals open. It's not by anti-growth policies. It's not by kowtowing to nimbyism. And I'm, I'm really shocked that, uh, that my opponent is promoting these policies that are, that are well, failed policies, and they are at the heart of why our Commonwealth faces a housing crisis right now. Well, I could see how we would differ. With, you have zero experience in the private sector and actually creating jobs, if this isn't fixed by mandates from the top down. This needs to be fixed from the ground up when the market builds the stuff that it needs. Mandating that towns build housing before they have the resources, and it, it's unsustainable. It's, My opponent fundamentally misunderstands the housing crisis in north central Massachusetts. Talk to any developer. They can go build housing anywhere in the state, and they choose to not build in north central Massachusetts because the rents are too low to sustain market rate development. Um, so we need to incentivize and spur private development. We are open for business in our gateway cities. In Fitchburg and Lemonster, we are working with the business community. We Senator. are working with builders. And I, I honestly- Could like, you expand on the rents being too low in North Central Massachusetts, please? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so in North Central Massachusetts, a, a two bed, one bath is $1,700 dollars a month. What if do you, you think go that 10 should, miles to the be? east, it's 3700 right? Um, so we are in competition with uh, capital that is mobile and people that can build housing anywhere. So we, we need to incent private what investment do you think to the build the housing we need what do you think to grow our be? community. 
What do you think the rent should be? For I want the rents going down, and the rents are going to go down by building more housing and attacking uh, our that, housing crisis yeah. with supply-side solutions. My opponent is anti-growth, he's anti-business, he's anti-workforce, and he's not going to promote policies that we need you, here in North Central Massachusetts to have a vibrant economy in the future. You've contradicted yourself right there. You said you want rents to go down, but two seconds before, you said that we were priced too low and that's why the builders aren't coming here. You can't fix this problem with mandates. You cannot fix this you with mandates. You fix it by building housing and, and you promoting policies that are gonna push developers into other parts of the state is the wrong way forward for North Central Massachusetts. Look, I, I know what the developers need more than you do. I've worked with them for 25 years. I disagree, years. I disagree. Okay, that's your opinion. Okay, we good? Yep. Next question. The last two years have brought us the closing of the birthing unit at Lemonster Hospital and most recently the closure of Neshoba Hospital in Ayr. As State Senator, what will you do to help ensure access to quality health care for residents of your district? Senator Cronin. Sure. So first, uh, we need to make sure that what happened at Neshoba Valley Medical Center never happens again, right? And Ralph Delator and Steward Healthcare sold our healthcare system out from under us. So I support legislation and I have voted for legislation that will prevent that from ever happening again. We're going to prevent uh, privately held companies from creating real estate trusts for crooks to steal money from our healthcare system. That's number one. We need to make sure what happened at Steward never happens again. Uh, Number two, I am on a task force appointed by the governor to mitigate and chart out the future for healthcare here in North Central Massachusetts. I have lobbied with my colleagues and we've been successful. We've got $250,000 grants for eight communities who are most impacted. Uh, that's gonna help our ambulances, that's gonna help our EML, EMS personnel mitigate uh, the, the long travel times to get to an emergency department. There's one outcome that's gonna be uh, there's one outcome that's acceptable for me, and it is the establishment and state support for a satellite emergency department somewhere in the Neshoba Valley uh, region. That's what we need, uh, but again, um, how do we stabilize our healthcare system in North Central Massachusetts in the long term? It's economic development. It's make sure that we are setting the conditions to grow our economy, to attract 21st century innovation economy jobs. It's housing. All these things are related. Uh, so we need to build housing. We need to attract 21st century industries. We need to increase our commercial payer rate at all our providers. Uh, that's why we couldn't find a new operator for Neshoba Valley Medical Center. So economic development is absolutely the key, uh, but right now, the state, uh, our work is not done, and it's unacceptable that state government hasn't done more, but we need to step up in a big, significant way. We need to fund a satellite okay, emergency expired. department. We'll get back to it. Yep. Five-minute uh, five open discussion. Mr. Piero. Senator Cronin, I agree with you in needing to step up in a big way, but it's the different way than what you're explaining there. Right now, the closures of Lemonster Hospital Birthing Center in Neshoba Valley, have, you know, that happened on your watch right there. The reason these hospitals are closing is because of the government mandating what they're being reimbursed. It's setting up these small community hospitals for failure and more regulations and forcing them to stay open when it's unsustainable financially is not the key. There is many issues that need to be addressed and a lot of it on the legislative end to before blaming everything now on the, the owners. Now, Stewart Hospital, absolutely, there were some other issues going on there, but there are systematic problems with the way that we repay these hospitals and determine the amount of money that they're getting paid. It's, it, it's on the government that decides how much they get reimbursed. So when you have a lot of government-provided health care on a system that doesn't have a lot of insurance companies paying, the insurance companies don't have enough money to make up the costs for all the government, and it's just not going to work. Okay, opened up for five minutes. For so, so I have a question. So what my opponent's really saying is that we provide too much health care to poor people. Um, so who are you going to kick off a mass health? Who are you going to kick off a Medicaid? Why should we stop uh, pr promoting services? We need to increase those reimbursement rates. Uh, but, but what is your plan to, uh, to sustain the well, health care system and, and, and deal with the Medicaid rates? It's not to sit here and blame other people when the blame lies on ourselves in the legislature. We need to get that addressed. We need to make sure that the re 
the repayment rates are increased. And it's not about kicking anybody off of anything. It's about making sure that we do what's financially responsible. I mean, this, to, give, to give more resources by taxing the people that are working is not the answer. Now, I, I just think, my, again, my opponent fundamentally misunderstands how we stabilize our health care system in north central Massachusetts. It's by having a, ju a juggernaut local and regional economy. It's by increase, increasing the amount of commercial payers who are a part of our system. Um, look, our health care system is a mess. Um, it, it is complicated and it works like anything but a system. But our system is going to be stabilized if we have more commercial payers here. Uh, that's why they're not losing essential services in Cambridge. That's why they're not losing essential services in Somerville. So economic development, uh, bringing 21st century jobs with great benefits, that's how we're going to do it. And that's how we're going to increase services here in North Central Massachusetts. So do you think that the governor could have saved Neshoba Hospital had she wanted to? <laughs> So we need to find a new operator, right? and that is the charge before the task force that I'm on right now. And we're doing that collaboratively. We have UMass at the table, we have Emerson at the table, we have every fire chief, we have every town administrator at the table. We need to find a new operator to uh, establish and support a satellite emergency room department. Um, that's the outcome and the barometer for success of our task force, and absolutely the governor needs to do more, and the legislature needs to do more to, uh, to fund the resources that are going to be required to establish so that. Do you think she did everything that she could? I think she has a lot more to do, and I think the legislature has a lot more to do. I also believe that I, I am the candidate uh, who understands the health care market. I, I serve as the vice chair of the health care finance committee. Um, I have had a hand in the legislation that the, the Senate passed to, um, to make sure that another steward crisis never happens again. So I absolutely think there is more work before us. I'm not satisfied with where we are, and, uh, and, and again, what does success look like? It looks like the state supporting a new operator to establish an emergency department satellite. Uh, Senator, it seems like your um, allegiances are more with Boston than they were here. It seems like you're a little out of touch with the district. Does that maybe have something to do with the no, fact? No, not at all. I've delivered historic resources to this district over the past four years. Look at downtown Fitchburg. We've started public-private We've started public-private partnerships with the Fitchburg Redevelopment Authority, with the city. We financed the Fitchburg Arts Community. I got a $3 million earmark for the Fitchburg Theater. There is a renaissance going on, and your people might gawk at it, but I believe in North Central Massachusetts, and I'm going to continue delivering historic resources to the city uh, and to support the recovery. Lemonster flood. After September 11th, we went and we found $10 million. In December of 2023, we passed a supplemental budget before the feds denied uh, relief. We provided $3.5 million to the city uh, before 2023 was over. We got resources because we did our job. Myself and Representative Higgins, we called in every favor. We used all our political capital. We delivered for this city. In the last budget, we got $500,000 to the Lemons to Relief Fund in the United Way. We appealed the federal denial Denial for individual assistance. So I take great umbrage with the fact that I'm not connected to this community and that I haven't delivered for this community because nobody has delivered more over the past four years. Senator Cronin, 80% of your campaign contributions come from outside the district for the last three elections. 80% of your campaign contributions come from you. Hey, uh, you know, we have to run a campaign here. I have to get my message out, uh, and I'm not going to apologize that, uh, that I have to work to get resources to, to run a campaign. So that means when everybody around here is asking where you are, you're, you're out getting resources for your campaign out in Boston. No. Well, that's, that, the numbers don't lie. 80 percent. And actually, it's up to 85 percent this year. So, so what are you saying? I'm saying that, what you're, are you that you're more accountable to the people in Boston who donate money to you than you are to the people of the district. No, that's not true. Okay, the five minutes is up on this one. On to the next question. A state senator must deal with many complex issues and be able to work with others to get things done. How has your professional, educational, and life experiences shaped you to be the best candidate on this stage to represent the people of this district with knowledge and effective leadership? Mr. Piero. Uh, I've been in business for 25 years. I've grown up in this community. Um, my leadership style in my own business 
is I have different people that run different departments and I build an amazing team around me. It's definitely not about what I can do. I don't dictate the orders. I surround myself with intelligent people and I empower them to do their job. Um, this job is about listening to the people in the district, not telling them what to do. It's about relaying the information from the district to Boston and not top-down mandates. And I believe our current representative has it going the wrong direction. He believes in top-down mandates and dictating for the district what comes out of Boston. Senator Cronin. I think what we do uh, in this position in the legislature is noble. I have been involved in public service every minute of my life. I, I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution uh, and join the Army. I went to West Point. I led infantrymen in combat when I was 24. I redeployed with the same infantry company when I was 26. I've been tested uh, and, and I've delivered. I, I know how to build teams. I know how to listen to people. I know how to lead. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, there's a contrast here. Um, I believe character and temperament matter. I, I believe character and temperament uh, inform effectiveness. And so all of the professional experiences that I've had in my life have allowed me to deliver for this district. Don't take my word for it. I'm really proud that the people who I've worked closest with in this role are working really hard to reelect me. I've got the support of uh, the entire legislative delegation, but more importantly, the people who are on the ground who I work with every day, uh, the city councilors, municipal officials, select board members, school committee members. I have more than 30 endorsements from Republicans, from independents, from Democrats, who would disagree with what my opponent said that I've lost touch. Hey, I live, eat, breathe and bleed North Central Massachusetts. This job is all consuming, we are always on, and we are always available to our constituents. I'm really proud of the team I've built. Uh, the first thing that uh, we talked about, Kevin, when I sat down with you for my first interview was I'm gonna build a great team. My constituent services team does office hours in each of the 10 communities every month. Monday through Friday, we are available in person. Uh, we are accessible, we are competent, we deliver for people. We're in the business of helping people, and that is noble. And my opponent seems to think that public service, that working in the legislature is somehow not honorable, and I just don't think that's very helpful. Up to five minutes open discussion. I, I said nothing about it being honorable, and first of all, thank you very much for your service. That is very honorable, and to all the men and women who've worn that. But the issue with that being is that my approach is completely different than, than yours. It, your experience is a top-down military style command emphasizing... You've your, never led a rifle platoon. No, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying no. that I have, sir. That's not how it works. Okay, well, this is about listening from the bottom and going up. It's relaying information. You are a representative. We are, we are representing the district, and we are not giving orders from the top down. That is the difference between our leadership styles, is I'm listening to the people and will relay the information that they want relayed up, not listening to the information Boston and relaying it down. I disagree. This, this job is about public-private partnerships and reinforcing and supporting the great work that people in our community are doing. Let me give one example. So Newview Communities and the old B.F. Brown Middle School, the, the Fitchburg Arts Community, um, that project languished for 10 years, and it's going to have a transformative effect on north of Maine and downtown Fitchburg. They could not put their financing together. Uh, in our delegation, myself and Representative Mike Kushmerick, we went to work. We secured uh, nearly $1 million in earmarks um, by being really good at the legislative process. So we delivered for that project. We allowed them to close financing. And a vacant middle school that languished for 10 years uh, is going to be uh, artist preference housing. It's going to help that revitalization of Fitchburg. So, I mean, that's not top down, right? My job and what I've been successful at is reinforcing and supporting the incredible people here in North Central Massachusetts who do the work every day. And talk to a family member who got individual assistance from FEMA. Talk to somebody in Lemonster who is gonna benefit from the Lemonster Relief Fund, the half a million dollars that myself and representatives secured. I think they disagree with you that, uh, that we are out of touch. I think they disagree with you that uh, we are not responsive to the needs of our community. And I think they disagree with you with the idea and the contention that we haven't delivered and delivered in a historic way for this district.
Senator Cronin, do you know what the actual losses for Lemonster were during the floods? It was significantly larger than what you're over here boasting that you brought back the community to solve all these problems. And it's not- Hey, FEMA is a mess. FEMA, it, FEMA is political and public assistance for FEMA was denied for Lemonster and that's an absolute disgrace. We see it on the news right now. People in our communities need help when natural disasters hit. Uh, the roof of Tropicana Field got ripped off last night. Yes, our federal government needs to do more. Yes, FEMA, uh, it's unconscionable that they deny public assistance. I would challenge you, could you give one example of one legislator anywhere in the state ever, who two months after a natural disaster delivered $3.5 million outside of budget season to a community? Can you point to one legislator in this year's budget who delivered an earmark of $500,000 to the Lemonster Relief Fund or any fund? Hey, all these numbers are relative. I have done everything that I can do. I have fought as hard as I could for this community, and I've delivered for this community. Yeah, I wish it was $40 million, but it's not. I got more than anybody else, any other legislator across the state, I've delivered in a historic way. So I won't apologize that it's some fantasy number that's in your head. Do you think that those earmarks were rewards for voting with the party the way you should? I, you know what? We, we have been debating for, what, 20, 30 minutes. I've been talking about how I have... Uh, stepped away from my party and I've been fearless in doing that. I have no problem standing up to the governor. I have no prob problem criticizing the legislature. I have no problem criticizing what we need to do. This is the test that I use on every issue that comes before me in the state Senate. Is it the right thing to do and is it the right thing for North Central Massachusetts? And I stand by every single vote that I've ever taken to include the votes where I stepped away from the governor, I stepped away from my party. I'm not afraid of that. So you're happy to give out driver's licenses to illegal immigrants, multiple occasions. And the voters for chose that. The voters voted for that. Do you not believe in democracy? Do you I not do, believe in ballot questions? So speak, speaking of democracy, do you support the governor's emergency preamble to reduce the democratic process? So, so I, if we want to get into guns right now, no, Kevin, I'm we asking do that? about. I'm asking. You asked about democracy. I'm asking if you agree. Absolutely. That that went through a deliberate legislative process where we received public testimony. We heard from hundreds of people. Hey, and I voted for a bill that the Central Mass Chiefs of Police endorsed. Uh, so when law enforcement comes to me and they ask me for tools to keep our community safe, you bet I'm going to vote for it. Well, I believe law enforcement has come to me recently, uh, and I have. So I, got a, I have a question for you, Mr. Pirro. Are right, you we, that's for five minutes is up? Do you both want to do another two minutes? No, you can move on. No, move on. Okay, next question. What is the key to economic development in our region, and why are you the best candidate suited to deliver for our area, Senator Cronin? Two minutes. Housing, housing, housing. Right? Uh, my opponent seems to believe that we're not in a housing crisis. We absolutely are. Uh, I have a record of delivering on housing. I've created public-private partnerships with Representative Kushmerick in downtown Fitchburg that have funded new development. Today, in the city of Fitchburg, the Economic Office of Housing and Livable Communities uh, announced $1.6 million of grants to build new housing. Those vacant buildings that have been on Main Street for my entire life, you know, we are retrofitting them to revitalize our town, our downtowns, to increase housing stock. I'm the only member uh, of um, this delegation um, who filed the housing development incentive program and got it passed. So I've secured more than $2.5 million worth of earmarks that have been directed to downtown Fitchburg. I've passed tax reform that has allowed uh, a, up to $2 million tax credit to incent and spur private development in our gateway cities. And I wrote the bill, I filed the language, and I got to pass through the Massachusetts Senate to raise the housing cap at Devon so we can build for the first time in 30 years. That's pro-growth, that's pro-family, that's pro-worker, it's pro-business. And those are the types of policies, those are the types of solutions that we need here in North Central Massachusetts if we're going to have a vibrant economy. And in my opponent, I'm very critical of uh, what he's been proposing. He's saying, hey, if you're not already here, 
doors closed, right? Uh, he is promoting policies that would stop new housing production. He's against the MBTA Communities Act. He's against zoning changes. He's against tax reform to incent private development. That's not good for anybody in this room. That's not good for the generations that are gonna follow us in North Central Massachusetts. And again, that's not good for business. Mr. Piero. Uh, yeah, so for, I'm the only person on this stage right now who's created 30 plus jobs, created, started businesses. Senator Cronin, I have the experience in the private sector. I know what it takes for economic development. I've worked with the contractors. I've dealt with the mandates that have been passed down from the state and the, un, and the regulations with the unforeseen consequences. I know what it takes to make an economy work. I've de dealt with it. I've had to make the tough decisions. I've had to lay people off when there was state mandates put in. I've created jobs. I've worked to help my employees get there. It's not all about regulations and forcing things on people. It has nothing to do with me saying, I've never said that if the doors closed, don't come here. What I'm saying is that we need to prioritize the people here first. And a free market is gonna determine what we need. So just forcing housing on people without schools and the necessary support that goes along with it is irresponsible, and especially doing it with taxpayer money. The job is of a senator is to represent the people of the district and do what they want, not what the Boston elite want, and I think you've lost touch with that. So we have an aging population in North Five Central minutes. We have an aging population in North Central Massachusetts. We have a declining population in many of the municipalities that I represent and the region as a whole. Our demographic trend is going down. So we need to attract young families. We need to attract young professionals. And if we don't do that, we're not going to attract a 21st century economy. Housing's at the key to that. And I think there's a huge contrast uh, between myself and my opponent. Um, we need to talk about economic opportunity and pathways to the middle class, because that is the key component to economic development. I want to mention one program that I'm incredibly proud of. So in my first Senate debate in fiscal year 21, I passed an amendment that had never existed and created a line item in the budget that had never existed for innovation pathways. So they are work-based learning programs for juniors and seniors in comprehensive high schools that are aligned with an in, in the region uh, industry. So advanced manufacturing, healthcare, business. That, I got the first uh, year in at 600,000. I've come back and back and back each budget year. That line item is $5 million right now, and it's expanded to more than 50 comprehensive high schools across the state that now provide work-based learning experiences for juniors and seniors. So we are giving kids the tools that they need to go into our local and our regional workforce and get a middle-class career, uh, and prosper, and stay in the region where they grew up. I'm incredibly proud of that program, uh, and I can talk about vocational education until the cow goes over the moon. We need to get the trades back in high school. I passed in this year's budget a commission to uh, get everybody at the table, comprehensive superintendents, vocational superintendents, uh, everybody from the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the legislature. And we're gonna make recommendations about how we put voc annexes at comprehensive high schools, like Fitchburg, Senator like Cronin. Gardner, like Lemonster, to get kids vocational Senator training Cronin. and train them to the skills we need to grow. How many times have you stepped foot in Neshoba Valley Tech in the time that you've been a senator? Neshoba Valley Tech? Hmm. So I have a lot of issues with our superintendents at vocational schools because how, they're how violating many, the civil how rights. How many? Is that zero? Z zero I, times. Excuse me. Zero times you've been there. So I have been fighting with the superintendents of vocational schools, and I'm incredibly proud of it because they are using... Fighting does not solve the problem. No, it, it absolutely them doesn't. It. Creating a commission to create more vocational training in our comprehensive high school solves the problem. So how do you... Creating a line item that's now $5 million to create how are you working learning with them opportunities if you don't for juniors even speak, and seniors How do you work with them the if you don't even speak to them? That's not true. It is true. How no, many times that, have you been there? So I have met with the superintendent at Neshoba Tech last week 
uh, with the Chair of Ways and Means at the State House, and we are getting stakeholders together to create more opportunity and equitable admission standards. How many times have you been to Neshoba Valley Zero, Tech? and I've been to Monty Tech 10 times, and I've been to, uh, I, I go to schools all the time. Uh, and so w what does that mean? It means that if you're trying to work with the vocational schools to I met with the superintendent it, last week. Well, if you don't go there, you are out of touch with what they need. No. That's, that's absolutely true, because they're, they've asked you to come there before, right? You've been invited. All you've been is very critical of them, and you're critical of the... I'm critical criteria. of everybody who doesn't comply with the civil rights standard. So let's talk about that. So vocational schools like our vocational school, Monty Tech, uh, when kids who are growing up in poverty in north central Massachusetts apply to Monty Tech, they get in at half the rate as kids from more uh, affluent backgrounds. That makes me upset. Right? And the kids who are going into the workforce after they graduate from trade school, uh, they don't get access to learn a trade. Why do kids from more affluent communities and more affluent backgrounds get more access to our public schools? It has so I am absolutely yeah. going to continue to hold uh, superintendents who are violating the civil rights standards feet to the fire, and I'm not going to go for coffee until we get them at the chain. Uh, I'm not going to go for coffee with them until they change their behavior. What, do you had an issue with the selective criteria that they were using for the kids getting admission there, right? So do you think lowering standards to get more kids in is the really way to do it? I think or it's do you inconsistent think it's the with the civil rights standard to rank order students based on grade. Look, there are a lot of kids in seventh, eighth grade who come from tough backgrounds, and they don't have as good a grades as kids who come from more affluent backgrounds. And, you know, our public schools fundamentally are not private schools. They're public schools, and poor kids should have the same access in North Central Massachusetts to a vocational uh, education as anybody else. Senator Crow, so they I don't have understand the same, what you're they arguing. They have the same access. No, they, they do, do not. They have not No, create. they do not. They get in at half the rate. What is the reason? Because is it we attendance? rank order students attendance? based on grades, and we use a private school admissions regime at our public schools. Again, that hurts our workforce. It hurts our, uh, our labor force. It's the reason why nobody can get a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician. It's the reason why the cost of construction is so high. Um, Our time is up on this. Do you both want to continue? I'd we'll like to on. continue this because ahead, sure. I would like to know which one of the criteria is the most is that you feel Grades is unfair. are the most harmful. I'm glad, uh, I'm, so, I'm glad you raised so that. So you don't think no, that like hard work should be rewarded? So if somebody works harder to do... Continue, please. No I'm, no, I'm glad you asked that question. So I have filed legislation to implement what has been going on at charter schools for the last 30 years, and that is lottery admissions. So lottery admissions make sure that kids from every socioeconomic background get in at the same rate. And ACIBIT, where I've been, uh, ACIBIT Valley Tech has instituted a lottery over the past two years, and it did exactly what I'm saying it is going to do. It's going to eliminate opportunity gaps between kids from disadvantaged advantage backgrounds and kids from more affluent backgrounds. It means if you grow up in poverty, you're going to get in at the same rate as a kid uh, whose parents are millionaires. That's the right standard for every public school okay. uh, in every uh, corner of Massachusetts. The, the right standard is the harder you work, the better you do. It's not equal outcome for everybody. Equal opportunity is there. Equal effort is not, and that's why there's some differences there. So if, we want to so if you want to solve the differences there, then there needs to be other changes made because lowering standards for people to get into tech schools and then to go into the workforce with the lower standards. Attendance was one of the things that you said was too restrictive, correct? They're, so they're not going into the workforce. They're going to four-year colleges. No, so you're, you're comparing apples to oranges here. The kids that are going to carpentry, electrical, plumbing, and the trades that they can go right to work, 90% of those kids are going to work. You're mixing, that's not true. That's not what, you're mixing the, the, that's numbers not what together. the outcomes the kids, are at our trade schools. The kids they're that they're are going more than to two, 50%. The kids that are going to two- and four-year colleges are the ones that are in the medical field, dental, the stuff that requires a higher education there. The people going into the trades are going into the trades, but you skew the numbers so the information does not come out. It comes out in your benefit, okay, not we did, the truth. we did the extra two minutes on that. Moving on. The legislature wrapped up its formal session with several issues unresolved, including expanding clean energy facilities, which will be taken up again in the next session. Please elaborate on your position when it comes to clean energy and climate change policy versus energy costs and balancing it with energy costs. Mr. Piero. Uh, so, 
when it comes to balancing the environment as, as well as the energy, I believe that we shouldn't have as many restrictive restrictions on letting people into the market to sell power. Um, we're also over-regulating. Massachusetts has uh, become a carb compliant state as of January 1st, 2025, um, which is essentially making it near impossible for anybody to purchase a diesel truck uh, that delivers all of our stuff. We, we can't prioritize the environment over the public safety of everybody else. We're not going to have a place to live if no one can afford to be here. We're over-regulating everything when it comes to this stuff, which drives up the costs of everything. They don't realize a lot of the unforeseen consequences of the mandates that are pressed from the state level down, and that's the experience that you get from working in the private sector in dealing with these mandates and regulations that are imposed. My, my opponent, um, his primary concern is diesel trucks. It's almost like he owns a fleet of diesel trucks. Um, there's a contrast here. My priority is ratepayers. Um, we need to bring down the cost of energy in north central Massachusetts. And I have been fighting teeth and nail and working with members of our delegation to do that. Um, it has been a top priority for us because ratepayers are my top priority. We brought Attorney General Andrea Campbell uh, out to Lunenburg and we had a listening session. And she brought with her everybody on her regulatory team. And so when Unitil filed for their rate increase, um, DPU and the Attorney General, we were all over them and they rejected it. Um, we need to get more supply into the grid to get our rates down, right? And we need supply from everywhere. We shouldn't be dependent on natural gas from Russia. We need energy independence in this country and in this Commonwealth. I have voted for uh, historic investments in clean energy, in offshore wind, uh, that's going to uh, power hundreds of thousands of, of homes. Uh, we need to site and permit the transmission capability and systems to get more clean energy onto the grid. Um, so we need to increase the supply. Uh, we need to continue to stay on the utility providers. And I want to say one more innovative thing that my office has done. You know, we have brought together Unitil, Eversource, and National Grid, uh, and we are proposing that they go out and they procure supply together. So they will have more bargaining power if they go to market together to purchase supply, and that's one of the innovative ways that we are working to bring down costs to the ratepayer. Um, that is legislation that I plan to file next session, uh, and again, it's going to continue to be a top priority for me uh, to work for ratepayers and on behalf of them. Five minutes open discussion. Uh, it seemed as though you thought me owning diesel trucks was uh, detriment or it was something bad. It, what that goes to show is that I understand what the transportation needs. What the legislature doesn't understand is that every single mandate that you impose upon the transportation system increases every cost from that bottle of water you're drinking to the jacket you're wearing. Everything increases from toothpaste to shampoo, all the food you eat, every single product you consume is going to go up with additional mandates. We're already losing people, moving out of this state to other states, and we're losing their tax revenue because of the tax and spend policies here. Forcing people to pick what you want them to pick is not the right thing to do, especially when you don't know the unforeseen consequences that you guys are imposing. It's irresponsible. So I think this, you know, this is another area where I actually uh, do agree with my opponent. Uh, and I have sent a letter and I've worked with State Representative Meg Kilcoyne to ask the governor to push back those mandates specifically on diesel trucks. Uh, I don't think um, the standards that are being imposed are realistic, and that's the approach I take to everything, right? I, I understand that there are regulatory burdens that the state imposes, and when they're unrealistic, uh, I will fight against them. So um, this is actually an area of agreement that I have with my opponent, uh, that you know the state needs to realistically assess what is possible, what is not possible, and where the market is, right? I and mean, we have these clean energy standards for these heavy duty trucks, and uh, they're not available to be purchased on the market right now. So on things that, uh, in places that we impose mandates that are not realistic, uh, I think I address those issues with pragmatism, and, and I agree with my opponent, we need to relook them. 
Uh, when did you, I saw the letter that went to the governor asking to push back those things and I did not see your name on it. I'll there. send you a copy of it. Uh, so I don't know if there was a second letter that went, but the one that I saw with approximately 25 senators and representatives. I haven't been CCing you on most of my correspondence, no, no but problem. I'll be happy to share it with you. So. Anything else on this? Nope. Nope. All right, we don't have time for another full round, but let's, uh, question five has been getting a lot of play. It seems to be the most, uh, uh, most prolific in terms of discussion. So could you tell us your positions on uh, your question five? Senator Cronin, two minutes. So, so I'm a no on five. Uh, I met with Bill Brady and a number of servers, wait staff, and restaurant owners uh, earlier this week with Representative Margaret Scarsdale. It's going to lead to higher prices in restaurants. Uh, and, and question five is tip pooling in our restaurants. It's going to lead to higher prices. Um, wait staff, bartenders, back, uh, um, you know, back of the restaurant servers, they don't want it. So we need to listen to our small business owners uh, who say that this is going to create a death spiral in the restaurant industry. And our restaurants like Brady's are absolutely the beating heart. Uh, of creating downtowns that are a destination. So I am a no on five, and I, I hope everybody will join me in, uh, in protecting people like Bill Brady, who are uh, great members of the Lemonster community, and voting no. Mr. Pirro. Well, Senator Crow knows my stance on this one, as I had an event for a no on five event two weeks ago. So I am in 100% agreement with him on that one. Uh, that is being imposed on us and from a out-of-state uh, organization that's trying to impose their beliefs and standards on us here in Massachusetts. Okay, question three, allowing rideshare drivers to unionize. Mr. Pirro. Uh, that's a no for me. Uh, they, um, rideshare drivers is not meant to be a career. That is a, they are employees that are, or not employees, they are independent contractors that are determining when they're gonna work and how long they're gonna work. An employee is someone who has to show up at a certain time stay a certain amount, and then they're relieved of when they're able to go. That is not the case with the rideshare drivers. So my um, no on question three. Senator Cronin. Yeah, I, I'm for question three. And I, um, you know, this isn't on my LinkedIn profile, but when I was in law school, I worked as an Uber driver. Um, I think we, we have a lot uh, of work to do to make sure that independent contractors have good benefits and they are paid by these multi-billion dollar corporations. I think every job is one app on the phone away uh, from not being a career and, and that profession being just independent contractors. So I think it has implications beyond uh, just Uber and Lyft. I think it has implications for every profession and all of us, and I'm, I'm stand with our unions on that. And question four, psychedelic drugs, Mr. Pirro. Uh, I'm a no on that until there'd be more research. I, I agree with my opponent on that. I think it's a complex issue. I'm really troubled by the idea that people can cultivate it and grow it in their homes. I think we need more regulation for that. Uh, and I think that's something that needs to go through a deliberate legislative pro uh, process. We need to receive testimony uh, before that goes forward. So I'm a no. Question one, auditing the legislature. Uh, the auditor being allowed to audit the legislature, Mr. Cronin? So I believe it's unconstitutional, right? I, I swore an oath uh, when I was 19 uh, to the Army. I swore another oath to the Massachusetts Constitution when I took this job. I will not uh, um, endorse a policy I know and I believe is unconstitutional. I think it's gonna be struck down by the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, I embrace the values of transparency, um, but not at the price of uh, violating my oath to the Constitution. Mr. Piero. How do you pick and choose which parts of the Constitution you're gonna uphold? Like with the 4885 uh, voting to take away people's Second Amendment rights, and you don't think that that's gonna be voted so, down so by I'm the I'm happy courts? to talk about the gun control well, bill. I wanna talk about three things very quickly that, 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 that we voted The question for. was is well, you're how asking you the and, I'm asking how you I, pick and choose. Kevin, may I respond to this question? Quickly, we need to get to closing statements. Police came to me and they said Glock switches are being used for gangway and violence and they're not banned. We banned them. Uh, police came to me and said that we are printing 3D guns that are unregistered. We registered them. That's a common sense uh, gun control reform that law enforcement asked for. Uh, law enforcement came to us and said extreme risk protection orders that take away uh, weapons from people who are mentally ill, from people who are violent. Uh, are, 
aren't expansive enough. So we're allowing social workers and other people to petition a judge to take away firearms from people who are violent, for people who are mentally ill, from people who are going to create uh, and cause trauma and violence in our community. Thank you, Mr. So, Pirro, 30 seconds. You don't feel that that infringes upon people's constitutional rights whatsoever? I mean, what's next? Freedom of speech? I mean, you are stepping all over people's constitutional no. rights there. No. When the police come to me and law enforcement says, we need new tools to keep our community safe, uh, I take that responsibility, responsibility seriously, and I, I support the Second Amendment. I support our sportsmen. I support our hunters. I've used a lot Senator, of weapons I mean, in my Senator life, Coding, but we listen, balance things because things are complicated. You don't support the Second Amendment or the hunters. You know it, I know it, and they know it. You okay, do we not. need to get to closing statements by virtue of a coin toss. Senator Cronin, you go first, three minutes, closing statement. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. It's great to see a crowd. I guess the word didn't get out that the Bruins were playing tonight. Um, but I also just want to give a special thank you to my grandfather, who's going to be 92 in 10 days and uh, has been my hero my whole life. So, Papa, it's good to see you. I did, and Kevin and the crew at FATV, can we give him a hand? I mean, he's unbelievable. Thank you, but it's coming out of your three minutes. That's okay. All right, to our community, it has been the honor of a lifetime to serve as your state senator these last four years. And in my heart, I truly believe that North Central Massachusetts is a region on the move and that our shared future is bright. When I first ran, I promised and I believed that my experiences as an Army officer and leading soldiers in combat could be leveraged as a senator to work across North Central Massachusetts with diverse stakeholders to drive progress and positive change. And in housing, transportation, education, uh, we've truly made incredible gains. With my counterparts in the House, our delegation has delivered historic levels of state funding to our communities. In particular, I'm proud of the nearly $40 million in combined annual school funding increases to Fitchburg and Lemonster, the more than 50% increase in state funding to our communities for roads, and the more than $10 million in disaster relief we delivered to the city of Lemonster following the historic September floods. And last but certainly not least, reinforcing and supporting the renaissance underway in Fitchburg. I'm proud to have delivered six million in earmarks and grants to the city's downtown revitalization, working in concert with the city and the redevelopment authority. We need to keep all this great progress rolling. Significant challenges remain. We need state government to step up and deliver more local aid to communities. We need to reform our education funding formula to increase per pupil minimum aid to help communities like Groton, Nashby, Townsend, Lunenburg, Shirley, and Westford who need greater increases in Chapter 70 funding from the state. We also need to mitigate the health care crisis in our region brought on by the closure of Neshoba Valley Medical Center and the corruption and greed of Stewart Healthcare and Ralph Delator. I'm the right guy to take on these challenges. I have a record of delivering real results and have built the critical relationships across the state and within our community to lead this work. I'm proud to have the unanimous, unanimous support of our legislative delegation and the endorsement again of more than 30 city councilors, select board members, school committee members who are Republicans, independents, and Democrats from the 10 communities I represent. The people I've worked closest with over the past four years believe I'm the right candidate to carry on this role and address the challenges that face our region. And I truly believe our team, this delegation, is just getting started in our work to move North Central forward. And I'd be honored to earn your vote, honor before November 5th, and continue to serve this community in our region. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Piero. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Please hold, hold the applause till the end, please. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, FLAP TV, FATV, LATV for hosting tonight's debate. Uh, the differences between my opponent and me are very clear. Uh, while the current administration continues to embrace a tax and spend policy that's going to drive up the cost of living, I bring 25 years of real world experience making hard choices to keep a business running and a family thriving. I know firsthand what it's like to face the same struggles you do because I live them every day. Uh, unlike the governor, lieutenant governor, and current representatives, I've had the responsibility of making difficult decisions, not just relying on taxpayer money to cover my mistakes. Uh, over 55% of my campaign contributions have come from within the district, not including my own. Uh, 
uh, showing that I'm accountable to the people of the district, not to Boston elites or special interest groups. As your senator, I'll prioritize affordability, transparency, and meaningful reforms to improve our district. I've also pledged to open a nonprofit to support causes here, and any leadership stipend I would be given, I receive, will go directly to benefit our community. It's time for balanced, accountable governance that puts the needs of the people first, and I humbly ask you for your support and your vote. Thank you. And that, and that concludes this debate. We want to thank all of the audience members, or most of the audience members, for respecting the rules as participants. For those of you watching on TV, please stay tuned. Uh, we have a roundtable discussion with, uh, hosted and moderated by Glenn Fossa with two Democrats and two Republicans to talk about and analyze tonight's debate. So please go out and vote. Thank you to both of the candidates.